there's a there's a lot of different ways you can break this down into different subsets and use different skills and strategies and they're almost endless in how you can utilize these different tools so um you know we'll start with just trading versus investing what's the difference well trading is is typically what you'd think of as like a day trader somebody that comes on looks at the market from like on a daily basis and looks for edge in the market to capture quick returns and and thinks of it as more of like a short-term position um, with the ultimate goal of always gaining in U.S. dollar value. Um, and in some cases, I would say like a lot of the smart OG crypto whales, they think of things in terms of Bitcoin or Ethereum um, because those are like the metrics for measuring wealth in crypto. So in the early days of crypto, when it came to trading, you really measured your account in Bitcoin. And today, you know, you, you have two types. You have people that measure their wealth in U.S. dollars or stables and people that measure their, in their Bitcoin or Ethereum value. Um, and so with this uh, trading versus investment thing, <clears throat> a lot of times you can apply this trading skill to either figure out good areas to do dollar cost average your way into the market. Or you can like actually actively trade uh, a portfolio on a daily or weekly time frame. Um, so then trading is more short term focused, but you can use the skill of trading to do to use it to get better prices on long term investments. So I think breaking that down for people first is probably a good starting point. Um, I hope that explains that part. And, and what about swing trading too? I know I've heard people talk about swing trading in, in a crypto. Is that how different is that in you know traditional trad five versus in crypto and air? Air ecosystem in particular, are there interesting possibilities for swing trading? 100%. So swing trading would be more like the medium term. Um, if you were thinking about the market on like a on a cycle level, so you're thinking like four year cycles or two year cycles or six month cycles. I mean, there's opportunity in like the total crypto market cap here. If you're looking at it broadly, um, you know, what if I mean, it's so simple if you could just sell here, buy here sell here, buy here, sell here, buy here, sell here, buy here. I mean, that's, that's what you're looking at when you're looking at swing trades. So just like briefly, like you really want to define like how long you're going to be in that trade for. And it starts with a trade idea. So perhaps maybe you would have been looking at like the market over the last couple of years and you would have seen something like this. Um, and at this point in the cycle, it's, you know, it's good when you're thinking about these long term swing trades, like um, what's a good context to position myself to make sure that this trade is successful and where is it invalidated from? So if I'm looking at this price action here with no indicators and no other context, I, I, I would want to have more context on catching the swing trade. But like one way you could get context would be like if you zoom back out, and this is the one thing I try to remind people is you always need to zoom out and get the most data as possible. Um, so when you're looking at the total crypto market cap chart here, this is as much as I can get going back to 2014, uh, spring of 2014. Okay. And so what I would do, maybe here's an easy one. Let's measure, let's for our trade idea, let's measure based on time. So I'll go in here and I'll look for like the... Uh, date range tool and I would count the number of days let's say from this top to this bottom and like that's saying that it's 343 days um, and then let's say I just wanted to apply that we can see a clear cycle here let's just apply that to the following cycle and see how far off it was um, well in terms of that particular data point how would I know if this was the bottom here or not well this particular cycle had different price structure. So it, it uh, didn't do this big run up and create a blow off top. It, instead, this time it did like a, 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 a move up and then a rejection and then a second marginally higher high. And so that because the structure is different, straight up, straight down, and this was straight up, down up, and then straight down, you'd want to um, use that in your analysis. So then if we use this as the top, the second top, how close are we to the bottom this time? It looks like it was based on the previous cycle. You were literally 21 days off, about two weeks off of the actual cycle of low, basing it off the previous cycle. So you could basically take this information 
and now you have a process for measuring time on a chart and um you know as things go forward into this cycle you could have taken a swing trade down here and said hey based on past performance this was the low about 343 days in and based on this performance we're 343 days in we got to be getting close um so you'd start to scale in here and the idea is like you need to have a clear invalidation so like at this point you can't come in with your whole stack obviously you'd want to come in with a portion of your stack that you can dollar cost average into the market with because if you're like oh this is for sure the bottom we're close to 343 days in and you put in your ten thousand dollars it's everything you saved up here and then the market crashes an additional uh let's see 27 percent you might be shook out of your position you might be like oh no i was wrong and now i gotta sell and so it's on these longer term time frames it's good to measure things like the time and like the total drawdown from past cycles into future cycles. So it gives you more of like a template to go by to find these like longer term swing trades and never come in with your whole stack all up front. You just want to come in with bits. And this is like easier said than done. Cause like when you're convicted in something and you think you're right, you're going to have a tendency to want to put more in than, than you should at that time. Cause if you wait, then you could buy more down here. And then as this starts to come up, you get you get confirmation that you're you were right about your trade idea um now like at what level would if this would have kept crashing down like at what level would you invalidate say that your trade was invalidated and um have to make a decision would be you'd have to set that goal outright so in the case of um previous bitcoin cycle here this total market cap it fell minus 88 percent and in this cycle it fell only 75%. So you are good if you follow the theory of 88%. You are good all the way down here to 364 million. Or let's see, hold on. Yeah, 364 uh, billion dollar market cap of all crypto. So like, there. So it's kind of interesting, right? Because this cycle was a lot nastier inside in terms of like percentage down. Um, but maybe that was your invalidation level. Would be like, hey, if it. If the total crypto cap breaks below like 360 billion, I gotta I gotta cut my positions at a loss. And as long as you didn't put it all in there, let's say you bought some there, you bought some there, you bought some as it fell even farther, then at least you're DCing into the market, and then you don't have to like kill your position at a loss until like it invalidates your level. Um, or but when you're talking cryptos, like it's probably a better theory to just. You know, you could take these swing trades on these like six month or 12 month or cycle theory, but then you're kind of in it, you know, at some point and you don't really shouldn't be looking to cut a loss at a low um, versus like a day trader, which would definitely want to have clear stop losses. And um, you would only swing trade an asset that, you know, will survive. So it's kind of interesting where we're at with Pulse, which is a first cycle coin and Hex, which is on its second cycle um, where we're at in the market right now, because, you know, there's some people that might think that it's not going to make a recovery or it just won't perform the way they thought it would. And so they're, it's really putting into question that trade in a lot of people's minds, which is good because it means that not everybody's on the same side of the fence. Um, any comments you had on that swing trade kind of theory? No, I was just thinking, um, so is there a difference? Uh, yeah, I guess one interesting place to explore here too is, are there different uh, places or you mentioned coins too, like maybe, uh, I guess what frame of mindset would you have to swing trade hex and pulse chain versus some, you know, like, like a meme coin or something that you don't think is going to be around for a while. Like what kind of, uh, is it, you just, uh, adjust your, uh, amount that you put in it. Like what kind of, when, when you're looking at the different types of coins, uh, with swing trades and, and otherwise, how do you adjust, you know, your, your investments in, in these? So yeah, it's all comes down to portfolio allocation and and having a clear divider line for this is the the stack that I'm holding for the long term because I really believe in this product or this asset and then there's the stack that's the trading stack that that port, port of your portfolio is like actively can be used to make moves on different assets, right? Uh and so like the the long term stuff you should kind of just put in there maybe you're you're hedging any downside price action with a with a yield bearing instrument or uh, staking or mining that that kind of goes this can be same for, can be said for like bitcoin mining as well 
um, where like some guys that are in Bitcoin, they'll just go hard on a, on a mining facility or have exposure to the miners, um, which is like a hedge for downside risk because then at least you're producing more um, through a revenue stream uh, in case Bitcoin price goes down. If you're just a holder of Bitcoin, you're totally reliant on the price uh, if you're not a trader. And if you're a trader, then you kind of have other tools like shorting the market with with uh with like a leveraged contract position uh, on margin or um so like you have the, so really the the person that's the worst off in terms of um that they, they basically have to let the market do what it's going to do is a guy that was to just let's say buy bitcoin spot it doesn't produce any more value for you it just sits there and you have to hope for the price to go up effectively so it's like the the weakest position you can take, but it's also the one that won't wreck you in terms of like, you know, Bitcoin will rise again. It's already established. Um, so, I, so I think that kind of explains the different tools that you can use. But here on like Hex, for example, how do we, I think it'd be inter like important to show a simple strategy for how to catch a swing trade on this chart. Because if you just held from the top, let's say, you didn't capitalize on any of these big explosive moves up 200%, 140%. This was like a 600%, 300% from the low. It's like, well, how do you know when it's going to finally do its move? And how can I more effectively swing trade this with my trading portion of my bag? That's not like my staking bag or um, that's not allocated somewhere else. And uh, two tools that I like to use is are the on the indicators here is uh, the RSI on the weekly and the MACD. Um, they're the, some of the most prevalent tools that a TA person will use, or like the they're they're really good at showing you zones of overbought and oversold conditions. So without going into the depth of like looking for bearish and bullish divergence, which you can do these things too. Um, you could simply have put this RSI on the weekly, uh, uh, pull this up on and on hex, and then um, if you come into the inputs here, normally it defaults to 14, so you're, it would look like this, which doesn't give you enough resolution to find edge because these are pretty flat zones, so you can't really, they're not really telling you much, as much as if you come in here and you. Um, cut it in half to seven now you can see more clearly kind of the edge in the market like if you just simply sold these tops um and then bought these lows on this weekly rsi you would have made money swing trading this chart so like hex was really the, probably one of the easiest things to swing trade in the past like two years because it literally on the RSI gave you the whole story right here. Um, and like in terms of percent moves from each one of these, just to kind of show you the proof is in the pudding. That one would have been 219 from that low. From this low to this high would have been a 78% move. This one would have been a uh, 140% move. And they, they take these these plays. They happen over um, months of time. They don't happen over a few days. So you kind of have to be convicted, and you have to zoom out and look at this on a weekly. Because if we like go to a daily, for example, it totally changes the RSI in, in a way that it's unreadable. Like you'd have to be pretty adept to figure it out. I mean, you could kind of see the same relationship where. Whenever the RSI would go below the 30 level or the 22 level here, let's say, which is right here, that was like the best time to buy hex over the past few years. Um, so you can c capture the data points on different time frames, but usually the bigger the better. And uh, and then down here on the MACD, I look for bullish crosses on this MACD. So when the uh, MACD goes below the zero line here, uh, you look for these green little arrows which i put in here just to signify the blue macd line crossing the orange signal line and uh, anytime that you get a cross up it's bullish and every time you get a cross down it's bearish but the bullish macd cross doesn't mean that you're going to see immediate results 
so this for example this bullish macd cross came in um right here on the price chart which re which resulted in a 74 percent move but then in the following weeks it actually fell 75 percent over 140 days and so your job here would have been to recognize this bull cross down here and just continue to like bring portions of your bag in over this period and dca in with conviction and then finally when this rsi bottomed here it was the same it, it the macd was still moving and put that bottom in there um it wasn't until we got that cross up there at this price level here when the fork happened to main net that this bearish this macd flipped bearish and you can use it you can combine these tools to find the pico tops and the pico bottoms right so um kind of combining just those two simple tools can give you a pretty good edge in terms of like tr swing trading which is probably a lot more effective of a strategy than day trading day trading can you could get marginal wins with there's so much more risk you're taking versus mm -hmm. you know you risk losing units of crypto um, but by big upside moves and you risk uh, opportunity costs um, somewhere else. How do you think we should tie a leverage into this too? Because that's, I know that's a big part of if you're able to go in the ecosystem and you know take leverage in, in one form or another, you know, we have different platforms to do it in different ways. How does that um, you know help you either chase yield or uh, in, in the trading aspect as well? How do you think leverage kind of fits into to this uh, aspect as yeah, so there's money to be made in holding on to some of these, um, like Fiat and Fame, for example, are some tools that we have. PHUX, uh, we'll get into that in a moment with LP, but with leverage, um, I'm pretty sure you can. Uh, now, I haven't done this myself, but if you go to the earn dashboard here, I'm pretty sure you can get this Fame token and earn on the fees that's generated by the protocol. Is that correct? Yeah, I think uh, Fame. They have a list. You see the different coins down there. I think that's the list of is like an index sort of. I think it's the way they treat it. Yeah, so it looks like this PHLP. You get paid the most for putting Pulse in, which makes sense because it's the native unit on Pulse Chain. Um, and so, like you can you can earn passively by having a portion of these protocols um, and basically owning the casino um, as people day trade or leverage trade there's uh, certain fees that's built into the model that uh, that traders have to pay on a regular basis and then you're just going to earn those fees um, by holding these coins and, and staking them through their protocol um, that's one way of earning which less which is somewhat less risky now if you're going to do something like this you have to consider what you're getting paid in and the price appreciation of that thing that you're getting paid in as well so there's an extra element of risk because you don't know if what you're getting paid in is going to go down, let's say, then what's the point? And people will say that about a lot of um, tokens that produce yield. is like, well, that's kind of one of the big pushes right now is, well, where's the real yield, right? That's the big uh, the big thing is like, and that's something that like Titan X is like talking a lot about is like you're getting ETH yield, which is, you know, real yield uh, because it's more established and has way deeper liquidity than a lot of these other things. Um, w and versus like getting paid in like PH LP token or uh, fame or whatever you're getting paid in here, um, which th like the price performance is so heavily tied to and reliant on like pulse chain success. Right. And it's early. So we don't know what that means for a lot of these other branched off ecosystems. So I would say that, mm -hmm. The most reward is in taking small bets on some of these things just to earn more units of crypto in the hopes that if Pulse Chain appreciates in value, everything that's tied to it will get pulled up and appreciate in value with it. I think, you know, when I think of real yield too, it's like something that a lot of people have been more interested in recently. I, I think it really is a reaction to the bear market, though, in, in a way. It is like, hey, you know, I don't want to get paid in the thing that's not going parabolic right now. I want it, you know, the less risky thing is to get paid in Pulse or ETH or, or whatever it is. The, the thing that you believe is going to be around for longer and has, you know, is maybe be correlated or, or whatever it is. Um, so I think, I don't know. I don't know how long that 
Is that, do you think that'll be a theme of the upcoming bull market? Or do you think, cause, cause on one side, okay, getting paid in. I the, think it's a L1. narrative, but I don't think it's the end narrative. I think once you see the kinds of mad gains that the hackskins are making again, everyone's going to have to capitulate back in that way. So That's what I was going to say with, with Hex. It's like, okay, you know, it's yield. Maybe you don't call it real yield because real yield is, is, is kind of being defined as the other thing right now. But yeah. the, the yield you're getting paid in Hex, if Hex goes, does 100x, but you're getting paid in some other L1 and it only does a two or three X. Which one's the real yield? You know, that sort of thing. Right. So real yield is a moving target. To the bear market. 100% it is. It's 100% a reaction to the bear market. People are getting antsy. They want to make money now fast. And, and if they're not seeing it in what they're in, they're going to go seek it out other places. Um, there's a difference there, though, with, with Hex, because the amount of APY that you can get for going long on that stuff is like out, it's going to outdo everything else. So before, but before we get into the whole, you know, this was one way to earn with the fame protocol was by, if you wanted to have passive income and you wanted to support a protocol that that gives a huge utility to the blockchain, fame is one to do it with because fame allows you to take up to, um, I want to say it does a 15 X leverage max. Sure. 30 30x, 30x is available on the long and shorting. Yeah. So 30x leverage max. Um, and on any position you could, you could come in here. People in my group have done taking good trades on, on this particular chart here that we're looking right in front of us, um, longing this chart and, and made money on this chart. And th they're able to do it through this protocol. You know, you can put in, you know, 10 million pulse and then, you know, go, 3x leverage long on one of these bottoms if you cap if you capture it right and you know have a good uh system for finding bottoms and then you can ride this up and uh you know it's the, the tough part with fame right now is the liquidity is so low that you have to wait for liquidity to open up in order for you to be able to put a position on um but and i think that that yeah, I'll, I'll just say just the other part with fame right now too is the volatility with the price movements where depending on how much X leverage you go, it's easy to get liquidated uh, if you're doing more than like one or two or, or five X or so. So that's the thing that's, uh, it is one of those platforms where like, wow, I can make a lot of money quick. I only got to put in a little bit and I can do big X's and, but then yeah, you, it's easy to get liquidated too. So yeah. So the, the way to think perfect. about like leverage trading successfully, I think would be, you know, you, your core position is going to be out, not on, you're not, your trading bag isn't your core position. And so that's already out there earning you passive income in units of crypto. Because remember, the, the baseline to this whole equation is your goal is to earn more units of, of as much stuff that you find value in as possible while the bear market is still here. And if you're waiting for dollar signs like the U.S. dollar value, like you're going to get jumbled up and you're going to lose units because you're chasing the wrong thing. Uh, the dollar is going to go down and crypto is going to go up no matter what. That's just like a destiny for this the way this economic system is set up but with with uh with these leverage platforms it allows you to put a very small bet down when when liquidity opens up and if you lose the bet so what but if you win the bet you're going to win it big and you're going to be able to use that as like um, a way to compound returns basically if you're going to take this route um a good example would be if you have a hundred million pulse you're going to only ever put 5 million pulse total into this protocol and and take you know reasonable leverage you know if it's only 1 million pulse you could go a little harder on the leverage part if you're really catching a bottom and you want to take a risk and the risk is you're going to put a 15x leverage position on with a million pulse which is one percent of your bag but you're pretty convicted that the lows are in then maybe that's the right play because you can on a hundred percent move you'd 15 times your you'd walk away with 15 million pulse or uh, on 15x leverage, I forget how the math works out, but you'd end up with a lot more pulse with only risking 1% of your bag. And then you have to put hard caps in there because otherwise you're going to turn out like a lot of these other leverage traders that they do too much and then they leave their positions in for too long and they don't put in, they don't have a good system for calling, you know, time stops. Like if it, if my trade idea doesn't go this way for this and hit these targets within this time frame, I have to kill the position. Like if, if it's not doing what you thought it was going to do within a certain time frame, you have to basically kill the position. And most people have a tough time doing that. They're like, no, nah, I'll just hang on to it because it's going to go up or whatever 
stuff they want to make up in their head, but you have to have a solid system when it comes to leverage trading. So I would not recommend it for anybody because there's better ways to make good returns elsewhere in a lot more consistent and safe way. You're not, you don't own these coins once you leverage them. Like they're, it's like a contract. Think of it more like that. So versus where if you're buying off the market through DCAs it's and you're investing over the long haul, that's actually something that you're going to be able to hold on to and, and just wait for the right time when the time comes. So one more thing on the real yield uh, too. I think I, I would be interested if there was a product on Pulse Chain that was doing uh, the type of like you earn. Uh, I mean, there are some products, right? Like you, you can you can stake liquid, liquid loans and power seed and stuff. You can earn PLS, you can earn PS, PLSX and stuff like that. Um, so funny enough, we kind of do have some real yield type ish products uh, out there. But I'm I'm curious to see if there you know any new products launching in 2024 on Pulse Chain. If they'll start saying, okay, instead of earning this token which we don't know if it's going to go up in value or not. We don't know how long we're going to be here. You get to earn pulse because we're able to, you know, cycle that through the system and make it all this interesting game for you. Um, so I wonder if there'll be any good products for that. I'm sure there'll be plenty of bad ones, but I don't know if there'll be any ones that stick around for a while uh, with the real, the real yield narrative. And it's like, you know, at what point does hex become real yield? It's when it, when it gains virality and mass adoption. If you three X the user base, it's getting there to the point where people are going to believe in it enough that it becomes real yield. Because it really is just a belief system in the end. And it only takes a few whales to push the needle, to push the price up, to support the market, to make it like social consensus is that, oh, no, you Hex is a real thing and you should have some. Like that's coming um, with price appreciation. Um, but if you 10x the, va the amount of like, let's say, miners in the system, like now you've taken a lot of Hex off the market um, and staked it out. And there's 10 times the users. So the price, it could go bananas, which is like what a lot of us believe is the path that we're on as eventually people are going to see this opportunity to yield, get yield through. So let's go into staking and mining now, um, particularly with Hex. Uh, someone here said that five-year APY on Hex is 16%. I feel this will be beat somehow. And so I was like looking through the uh, APYs here. The... Uh, the yield definitely does get better toward the end of the curve at round. You can see on these curves here, the APY comparison. So if like, let's say you had 10 million hex, which is, uh, like, what is it? Like 50,000 bucks on Ethereum and like a hundred and something on, or like 85 something thousand on uh, pulse. So it's a, it's a, it's a big ask for like, you know, regular folks that are getting into crypto, no coiners to like bring in, 50,000 or a hundred thousand dollars to get 10 million hex. Um, but even just starting with a million, get like, make your goal a million, a hundred thousand first, then a million, then, then 2 million, then 5 million, then 10 million. I think the next generation of hexkins are the ones that did start that way. They didn't get the, their bag sizes. They didn't have hundreds of millions of hex or tens of even tens of millions of hex from the beginning. And there wasn't a lot of folks that actually captured that opportunity, but the way you get it back and you start to earn that back, is you get that first million or or you get that first five million and that you start putting out stacks past five years because once you get past five years is when this curve goes exponential in terms of your real yield that you're getting um and it's a good hedge uh you think about um where this could be in terms of price over the next few years you know we there's a uh, something crazy that went on with this cycle with hex where it it had a whole new mainnet launch and a duplication of the entire supply. And that's not something that's going to happen twice. And that's also reflective in the price is that divestment out of EHEX and into these other things. So it really is a huge opportunity to, to capture supply at the lows here and, uh, and then consider staking a portion of that out past five years where these APYs really start to pick up. You're right here. It's I'm seeing the APY at for five years around 16 and a half percent, but over time, um, if the staking hate behaviors don't change and more and more people stop staking, um, those cur that curve actually goes up even harder because you're you're locking in that t-shirt rate now for more of the supply of the pool. It it didn't feel like I thought I would see more people, and, and maybe it happened in the data. I'm sure you and you and Chris have been looking at this too, but I didn't feel like as many people were taking advantage of locking up t-shirts last year as I thought they would be. Like I, I was talking about it a lot. I was trying to talk about it too. I'm like, hey, do you understand the low hex price mean you can get more T-shares with the with the amount of hex you're going to buy, you know, stuff like that. 
and I did the, ran the numbers. I did all kinds of streams and and uh, clips and stuff like that. But I just don't. Did you did you all see anything in the data where you saw people taking advantage of this, or was it just kind of this missed opportunity? I mean, I think staking behavior has come down a little bit compared to where we were, you know, in past years, which is kind of bullish for the current staker class because they're like seeing more and more returns. Um, but I thought maybe, you know, we have seen like, I want to say there's about 500 million hex out in the year 2039 now, something like that, which is, that's a lot of hex that's staked out there in 2039. That's what Chris, I think pretty sure that's what Crispy told me was that that's roughly where we're at. And so if that's any indicator like of where energy is going to go, it's going to go longer uh, because of that. We're all capturing um, a unique part in the cycle where you can get more units because the dollar value is so low. Um, but here, let's just use that, you know, five-year marker as an example. Uh, you can see kind of on here what the ROIs and EHEX are. And the ROIs and PHEX, they're roughly the same because the share rate's doing the same thing. It's the same forked system with the same user base. So for the for the most part, they're paying out the same numbers, right? And uh, yeah, I mean, if HEX gets to ten cents, which we were just there earlier in the year, uh, twenty twenty three, um, your million principal that you could snipe down here at these prices would be paying you over a doubling, right? So you'd, your ROI would be 117%, which might not seem like a lot right now in dollar terms. If it's like 4,000 bucks, but it turns to 8,000, yeah, that's not, for, for a lot of folks, they, they, they want crypto gains. They want 100 Xs and stuff. And I think that's going to betray a lot of people because they're going to miss the opportunity of getting so many units here at the lows before the lows gets put in and you just can't get this many units anymore. And then you then you're for sure... Um, locked out of ever getting, you know, millions or tens of millions of hex. If you're just, um, if you're not willing to bring in, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. And so this 2 million could be a tremendous amount of, uh, of value down the, down the road. Is, is this calculator too? I know I had a question the other day about hexcalc.net where it uses eHex. Uh, and I see this one, uh, has both pull stand and Ethereum. Is this, uh, a public portal that people can use or is, or like, is there another calculator to do pulse chain hex? Sure. We can, uh, um, hold on pulse chain hex. I don't, well, you got hex scout. I think we'll calculate the amount of units you can get from a stake. Okay. So, so it's like, gotta, gotta act like you're going through the staking process to do it. Is that the I'm thing? Pretty sure. So if you want to, you know, learn more, let's see here. Um, it's somewhere in here. You can like, I don't want to show my shit, so I'm going to just chill on that oh, for now. Yeah. But uh, somebody's asked another day about, cause I know hexcalc.net always use that for calculating like, you know, future, future gains and what the price is this and price prediction stuff. Uh, but they don't support pulse chain hex as far as I know. So I was, we're, I'm, I'm wondering, and I'll, yeah. So you can, people are wondering how to do it. So yeah, you can go to hexcalc.net and just change the price to whatever the, e, the P hex price is at. And it's for the, for all intents and purposes, it's going to be the same. Um, so if you did, yeah, like that's one way to do it. Yeah. yeah. So you just check the, check the price over there. But, uh, yeah, so this will give you a payout, right? At this price today. And it's saying like, you know, for five years, I'm only going to make, oh, sorry. I did a hundred thousand. So for a million, <laughs> so for five years, I'm only going to make. 7,000 bucks seems like a ripoff <laughs> if the price stays flat. How do we know the price isn't going to go to zero? You know, I get all those questions. Um, but if that's where your head is at, you're probably not, you probably shouldn't be in crypto because you don't understand like how floor prices get put in and how the network effect works. Um, so maybe start there with more like the philosophical underpinnings of why this stuff works. Um, but then, you know, so then back to this other calculator, I mean, this, this is making assumptions that, you know, here's EHEX at 10 cents, 200 grand. And, you know, what would you have earned in yield? You would have doubled your back. So would, not only would it have been 100,000 bucks, it would have been 200,000 because you doubled your bag in that five-year period. Um, and then if it goes to a dollar, uh, well, look, PHEX at a dollar, you're looking at, you know, a huge multiple 
instead of just making a million, you would have made two million. So that's kind of the the process. I don't know. Was I on with you when I was talking about Bitcoin and hash rate and uh, how the the Bitcoin price always chases the hash rate? You could think of the T share rate in the same way, where the uh, the rewards are always getting put out. Right? Bitcoin always is producing more coins, and Hex is always producing more coins. And so the metric to measure the success of it is, is staker adoption increasing? Um, are people using it to stake? And and then is the share rate rising? And so is the cost to get more shares rising? And the answer to that is yes. The same with ne the Bitcoin network. The new equipment comes out, it costs more, it's more powerful, it can get more of, this, of the chunk of the inflation. And so the, the, the metric to measure these things by is the inflation curve um, I'm sorry, the, uh, the curve of the hash rate or the pr yield producing component, which is either the T share or, or Bitcoin hash rate. They're the same thing, just with a different, um, uh, different, uh, consensus model. And so with, uh, with the hex thing, I mean, you can change out like different, you can like on this uh, model that crispy built, let's just do like a 15 years. So it really shows you the curve over time and the difference on some of these different models. But this would be like his current most conservative estimate over time is like each year you're going to stack more and more over time. So it actually compounds the rate at which you earn. This yellow line is the ROI. By the by the end here by 2038 your your ROI your yearly ROI is 20 uh 30, is 38% here. Um the APY is at 40%. But it starts here, you know, your APY starts at 25%, but as time goes on and those stakes end and those old T-shares get burnt away and your T-shares still locked into the system, this pushes up the APYs that you're going to get over that 15-year period. And that's under the most conservative estimate. But if we switch to some of these more bullish estimates, um, like out here, now you're looking at 72%, 73% APY, 76% APY. Um, based on just like the ending of the stakes, the big ones over the next couple of years and then into 2030, there's some big ones. As that stuff comes off, those people are never going to capture those T-shares back without staking out an additional 15 years, which by then you'll have a whole new class of young folks that want into this investment vehicle that'll be buying up everyone else's bags at a higher price because the system is going to keep churning out inflation at a, at a understandable, at a, at a um, manageable rate. Um, which is like a lot of these other clones of Hex, they, their inflation model is messed up. Um, so you, you can even get into even more bullish conserv um, projections of like how high the APYs can get over the next like 15 years. This one here is showing you like a 91 to 95% APY. Uh, and then on a 15 year. And then here's the uh, crypto spar book estimate, which I mean the, it goes parabolic. It's assuming that adoption goes like crazy, and they, the stakes are getting um, uh, they're getting they have to buy more less units with more dollars, and so like the hmm. uh, it compounds. It makes it so that the supply gets way more distributed amongst a lot more folks, and they t they tend to start staking short first, and then they go longer as they build confidence in the system, and so it, it builds out. This was really the network an exponential network effect that would occur and it's the most bullish and the most um aggressive estimate for what could happen but i mean this is showing 430 percent on a 15-year stake and so if the price of of uh your ehex was only worth eight thousand bucks when you started or i'm sorry four forty four hundred bucks when you started it um it's saying here you'd earn 20 million hex for your 1 million principal that you put in 15 years ago on the most con on the most aggressive estimate so like then you look at the dollar number you're looking at there is is two million dollars but you have 20 times the hex so at some point depending on how the the thing plays out you're going to either have a lot more units or a lot more dollars or it meets somewhere in the middle which is most likely is you won't ever see the 20 million reward but you won't you might not only just see $2 million either because you might only make 10 million, but the price might go higher. So it's this rubber banding of price and reward 
that it's going to play this game of tug and war over the next 15 years that's going to really implicate like where where the the kind of returns you could see on these longer term stakes which is a dynamic system it's always changing guys is is that why hex appeals to people who both like to stake and lock things up for yield and also uh hold liquid just for price appreciation like the difference between uh locking up to to get yield say you know and then like making sure you don't sell saving yourself from yourself type of thing uh, assuming you don't do an hsi uh, or even if you do it's it's still like you still have to click some buttons make a decision and and maybe icos is working great at that time and the icos contract to give you a bunch of cool stuff um and then that so that the mindset of like staking for yield it's almost like a cherry on top too it's like okay no matter what happens if i believe the price is going to go up not only am i going to make yield I'm going to make the gains from the price going up. Is, is, is that the appeal to a lot of people in Hex? Yeah, and I think you you forgot one class of user, which is the traders that have literally just traded this thing all the way down, and they've made money on every rip, and then they've just bought that new local low. Like There are folks that have literally just bought the local lows and dumped the highs. And so there's this has been a trader's wet dream, this whole bear market, because there's been money to be made made in every in every single angle of this thing and yes i the staking element is a hedge against a, a messed up trade so that you're always going to have something earning for you you're every day at zero 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 utc you're going to get a payout so that if you mess up on one of these like swing trades they, they, there's going to be something there left for you wow i love this stuff man i, I love i, I think when people come to the ecosystem and they they see the price go down or they um you know have expectations that they need to you know make a lot of money now or or devs do something or whatever like when we get into the the weeds and we get to look at taking you know, a zoom out look at the bigger picture look at the tools we have look at the data look at the numbers that's what really sets not only this the, the technology the, the coin the, the token the network apart but the community apart and the ability just to to not i don't know i don't know how i I feel much more, much less, not that I'm frustrated, but if I'm ever frustrated, I look at, you know, doing streams like this or looking at the numbers, it's peaceful, man. It like, it makes you feel like, no, like stop fighting yourself out. That sort of thing. 100%. Um, and we all get there where we're thinking about just like the day to day or like, what's my dollar amount today, which is the wrong way to think about this thing. It's, it's better to just continue to stick to the strategy and, uh, you know, if that means that you're leveraging, you know, a combination of uh, trading and mining, then you know the best strategy to employ would be to have at least something out there past 10 years, um, something meaningful. That way, it's once you get there, at least that you'll have that at the end, no matter what. And then you can start to work on compounding through these other methods in the short term, like either trading and or uh, limit orders and uh, LP. So probably a good time to go into that quick. So this is the this is an LP histogram. And if you haven't, go check out Crypto Sloth's LP series on his YouTube channel because he goes and explains this in great detail how to read the histogram and and to strategize around it. So I'll just give you a brief overview. Um, on the left of the, the red line is where the price is sitting. On the left of the red line, these white bars represent Ethereum. And on the right of the red line, these white bars represent Hex. The taller the bar, the more units is sitting at that level. So down here, you can see there's not very much Ethereum sitting underneath the price right now. Um, and up here, you can see that there's a, a ton. It looks like there's a ton of hex sitting above the price right now. So this means that if a whale was looking to dump, there would be nothing to sell into here on this particular pair. There's just not enough ETH. This is like a half an ETH. There's a 0.85 of an ETH, a half an ETH, half an ETH, half an ETH, half an ETH. So yeah, I mean, you combine all this up, you might be looking at 60 ETH sitting here, something like that. So if, if you had like a 10 million hex sell you wanted to put through, maybe this wouldn't be the place to, to do it because you're going to sell into a black hole and this is going to push the price way out here down to down a lot farther. So the, the, the sellers are kind of what I would call trapped here. But uh, but and then conversely, if you're a whale and you're and you want to set the bottom and you're looking to buy, you love looking at all this hex liquidity here, because you could absorb all of this supply up, millions of hex. I think there's like probably, um, I would say that there's probably like 
120 million to 150 million e-hex on the market overhead of price right now. And so this particular pool might have like a portion of that, maybe 75, 80 million, maybe 90 million hex, which is like a half a million dollars worth of hex, guys, at this price. So you, somebody, whale brings in a million dollars, they can buy up all these bars of hex and push the price out to the front. And then it forces the market to reprice where value is at in the market. And so then all of this gets turned into Ethereum. And then uh, those guys either like exit the market and walk away or they get more hex, maybe market makers, and they'll put it out here where there's no hex liquidity yet. And so there's this like give and take of like the market pushing the price up and then pushing it down, pushing it up, pushing it down inside of these, what the market thinks is value. Um, and so you can use this to like not sell when you shouldn't, which is like right now would not be a good time to sell a huge stack of hex on the Ethereum chain because you'd be selling into a black hole and you'd be basically giving your coins away for nothing. And that's exactly what we saw here on this wick was the price got pushed down yesterday morning. And uh, if I zoom into like, let's go to like a daily here on this candle, it went down 16% lower and, and he got way less for his coins. He got 16% left for some of his coins. Um, and, and maybe that was coming off, like sometimes people just want to exit and so they'll just like sell anyways and they'll just get what they can get for it. But that leaves an opportunity for somebody to set in like limit orders down here where they can actually capture these, these like wick lows. Uh, so like if you, so like on a price chart, if you see like a big wick like this, big wicks like this, you can actually expect the price is going to try and go and eat that wick back up. And uh, you might want to put in limit orders when you, here's a good example, big wick down, about a 37% down, and then it bought, got bought right back up because there was people with limit orders sitting in here that pushed the price right back up. Um, and then look, the price did it then follow. This is another like trading skill. So to see that wick when it happened and not have any of this data you could have just thought to yourself, well, maybe this thing's going to go down and fill the gap. And it did, and it bottomed there, and then it went out. So you can do a combination of set and limit orders below that area and just hope to snipe it. Um, and then there's another level to this game that I'll explain in a second with uh, LP. So currently you could say, like, oh, where's the best place to buy eHex? Well, it might be down here, right? Something like that. Because... Uh, like like we said before, some the price does like to fill these uh, these gaps, which would mean that that would correspond with maybe more hex getting put, or sorry, more ETH getting put out here as support, or as the price falls down, more of this hex gets pushed back down in price, and so then it gets overloaded in this zone, which gives the market maker more hex to buy up at a better price, the farther that this red line trends to the left, which is down in price for hex. So do, do you think too, the, the low liquidity that we've experienced and maybe we can give it people just a refresher of maybe this time last year or six months ago or whatever it is, the big liquidity changes. We talked about this a lot before Pulse Chain launch, I believe, and just how is that, is that playing into a bullish scenario for Hex, for example, just having the low liquidity kind of feels like the old days where we don't have hundreds of millions of dollars of liquidity. We got like what, 20 million or something like that total. Uh, plus or minus on the ETH side on the yeah east side let's see maybe total. i can't remember exactly but it's there's not a lot so total there's two million bucks in liquidity million. but maybe it's like maybe on both chains is what i'm thinking of but yeah on the other chain there's a lot more there's like a few million like there's between five and ten million just on the uh just on pulse versus die which all the we can get into that in a second how orders route over there but it's because over here you're just routing through if you're going to buy and sell hex over here you're really routing through two pools you're either routing through hex usdc 0.3 percent fees or hex eth 0.3 percent fees and in terms of the tvl here this is what i wanted to show you was we were basically down here at the bare bones bottom um in terms of like how much liquidity is on the market we're we're back to we're back to the same levels we were at in june of 2021 before the big move up to um, 50 cents later on in that year, which is where liquidity got up in here. 
and uh, well, now we just we're it's you can see the market's been depressed ever since the SEC crash. It's just people have like uh, taken their liquidity off, and w- which gives it a lot of upside potential um, because, like I said before, all of that liquidity in here this is only like four hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand dollars of liquidity, and you're talking about an entire market with a hundred thousand stakers, so. You know, one or two big players can come in and absorb all this supply out. They're just waiting for the right time. And then on the uh, Pulse side, it's a little bit different. Uh, there's, if you click on the info, the three dots here and go to the info tab, you can do a little bit more data on like how much hex liquidity is really out there. And most of it's on V2. So if it's, there's a differentiation between V1 and V2. Um, I'll just search for hex as this loads. Toby says, quit giving away my secrets. Uh, I was going to say there's another thing you can do with um, LP. So if you wanted to, if you thought that the market was going to sell off here, I mean, you could put up a, a wall of liquidity down here. You could put up some Ethereum way below the price. And then you could put limit orders inside of here with using a protocol like Tetra or using a protocol like CowSwap come in here and you could set like limit orders that could, you could have them expire in seven days, a month, however long and say like, I want to sell my hex for, or my ETH for my hex at this price, whatever, whatever price I want. Right. And you, you can, you can switch here between, do you want to view your, your value in ETH terms or do you want to value it in hex terms? That can get tricky because People are used to seeing dollar signs. So like if I do it in dollars, it's like if I want to sell $1,000 for hex, I'm going to do it at 0.003. Then I would want to maybe go into the hex USDC pool and set up a liquidity um, down there so that there's something there for traders to sell into that I can both get and look at. Somebody's already down here between 0.003 and 0.0018 Point zero zero one eight with a with a brick of liquidity, probably hoping for that very thing to occur, which is for somebody to sell the price down into that liquidity range, and then if the if the price moves all the way down to here, they can pull that liquidity up, and they got a ton of hex for between zero zero one eight and zero zero three, and then they can then immediately push the price back up. Um, so there's like different whale games that'll go on where, or just not even whales like. This type of stuff can be pulled off with relatively small bags. It's not like fancy art, like only whales can do it. It's just like each one of these bars is only like $100. So there's not a lot of money down here, but it, there's enough support there that if somebody sold for like five grand or 10 grand and we, we went through all these Ethereum here sitting here and then there was nothing left down here, I mean, there's a good chance that it would tap this little bit of liquidity on the USDC pool and then you could snap up your liquidity when it turned into hex and then pushed the price right back up with just a couple grand back into the Ethereum liquidity up here. If you were designing the pump of a lifetime and you saw low liquidity, low price, you know, perhaps more favorable macros, uh, incoming, is there, is there things that when you look at here, the LP positions and otherwise that just make you think what, just one, one good piece of news, just one, one thing, could just you know ignite ignite the dynamite uh, in a oh factory. yeah I mean this is a good setup right here to just absorb all the supply up um, let's look at the stoplight ones hopefully this works so there's 172 million e hex on the books and I, I if you're wondering why do I use e hex for all this it's because all my tools are better for that so I can show this better and explain it better. But right now there's 171 million hex on the market total across all the Ethereum pools. So then, you know, all this, this is, this is representative of this brick here. Like this brick here is part of that 170 million. Um, There is more on the USDC pair that's up around three to five cents that we all know about. But the majority of it is right here. And um, in terms of what's immediately accessible. And so, yeah, you could just one good bit of news and like, this person's going to, the whale could snipe up like 50, a hundred million of these things right off the market and try to provide price support at a higher level. Is um, that what would happen? Maybe take us through that too. Like what would, 
what would happen? We get the one piece of news and it's like, you know, SC drops the case or, you know, uh, Richard makes some appearance or I, whatever it is where the market believes it's favorable. And it, is that, yeah, what, what would be a scenario that would, that would actually make sense? Not like some, you know, crazy moon math th- thing, but like, what is there a scenario that's like, okay, there's a bunch of stuff here. People may come in and scoop it up. You know, yeah, so this would get out. scooped up, and this price out here is uh, zero. Let's see, five zeros and a six. So we get the only way I, I have to do some calculations to figure out where the hell this price is in dollar terms to make make sense of it. And so the way you do that is you'd look at hex Ethereum, and I like to invert the chart so I can see it against. Um, it kind of like it's it's the opposite of what you'd think. So here it is, ETH denominated in hex so let's see oh let me go back one what i say it was zero zero six zero zero six yes something up here so yeah we just basically come back up to where alex the whale pumped us to um that's where this brick this liquidity brick is sitting is between here and here and so that would all get absorbed, and then you'd want to see some sort of support put in by big Ethereum buy walls put here once that move happened. And then in you terms just of draw, just... Sorry. You, you removed I was going to say, do you just draw a whale with a green candle going up through its face? <laughs> <laughs> That's what it looked like on the chart. Oh. Okay. Um, what was I going to say? So, yeah, my, and just in terms of like... So this is... it. I, I'm looking at a lot of different... Uh, charts here I'm looking at that was valued in weath, but here it is in dollar terms. You could say uh, you could say that this is, was building out to be like an inverse head and shoulders, which is this is a shoulder, this is a head, this is a shoulder. The shoulder is kind of really reaching down though; it's getting uncomfortably close to br- like invalidating that that theory. But if it, it does end up playing out, and this is it in terms of downside, um, this move to here is like on automatic rally. And then uh, if you break the neckline and retest and go, you're, you're looking at a push up to where two cents is like kind of where I would see the price going anywhere between 1.7 and two cents somewhere in here. So we're just waiting for the something to spark us up, spark it and get it going. It was looking really, really good in here for a minute where we were getting this like positive trend and we were trying to break above this 111 day moving average. And then some, somebody came in and just nuked the nuked the move, um, cool. which is fine because the longer you spend down here, honestly, the better, um, building up. Cause like, look, we could basically spend the next like quarter just going sideways down here. And then all of a sudden you'll get that move. That'll just like shoot off the chart. Kind of like what we had here. Yeah, it's fun to want to show people too this the power of liquidity, power of low liquidity, even. And yeah, just that that one piece of good news that you, you never know could come at any time. And then whales are like, all right, let's let's deploy, let's buy, let's let's stop beating this thing down. Let's uh let's go to the moon type of thing. So liquidity is just always fascinating to me of how that plays into price, not just with bonding and otherwise, but with just the again, not much there. Of course, price depressed. TVL goes up when, when, when price and everything goes up, people, more people want to deploy more capital, more people feel comfortable uh, trading it and putting it for sale uh, at a certain point too. But yeah, I think the power of liquidity for, for Hex right now is very interesting. And then like farming, uh, in terms of Paul Sex land, I have not been too keen on farming or, or even yield arb for that matter. Like there was, to me, the this is so much more work than doing using these other skill sets. So like my expertise is more into this stuff. Well, we'll take us back like six months ago with farming, for example, were you doing, you know, back when ink was, ink was amazing. Everyone loved it, did $80. And then we were farming and getting, you know, thousands of dollars per day with, with relatively modest positions and stuff through, through ink. Can you, maybe that's a good framing too. Like why was it so good before and why is it less interesting now? Yeah. So again, this is like a game of attrition and you're basically fighting for more units. So if you're sniping up ink on these lows and you're putting it up against Paul X, which is also tremendously undervalued, that to me seems like a good place where you're not risking so much in permanent loss of your pulse bag, which is your main mover. Um, but you can still take two of the underdogs, which is ink and pulse X and just earn more and more ink, which is, that's the only really way I'd see playing this farm currently. Um, 
personally. Uh, I just, and I, I think I, I don't want to say completely, but I'm, I'm, I am personally fully uninterested in this no matter what, because I think that there's better options out there. The prices are so depressed on everything that I, I'd rather buy the main movers like Hex and Pulse, like hundredfold. I would, I would rather buy these right now, even though these are a better buy, even though Inc and Pulse X and Ehex are a better buy. I mean, I put a lot of my capital into the Ehex side because I think that that gives you leverage to get more of this stuff down the road as it, you know, regains its uh, dominance. But uh, just that, like in the short term here, like these are the most attractive coins to buy in the RH stuff is Hex and Pulse. And uh, so it's really a game of how much of those can you get, how many units can you get at the lows? Because eventually these things will, these undervalued ones like Ink and Pulse X will go up a lot harder. And so then you'll be able to flip those into the more of these because they'll outperform them. But we're not there yet. Um, however, with that, I, I did notice that Pulse X is trying to put in a higher low against Pulse. So this is probably the time to start looking at Ink and, and, and particularly Pulse X um, being set like 3% of the supply has been burned and another 3% of supply being burned to come in the next year. So, um, what, what, but yeah, in terms of farming, yeah, I think would, that, yeah. No, I was just going to ask uh, for farming too. What, what would, if you saw, what would make you think, wow, that's going to be crazy if something happens to the farms? Is it another, you know, WPTC farm? Is it, um, what would, what update do you think could happen uh, this year where you're like, all right, farming's great again uh, on Pulse X. Yeah. It, ink is totally dependent on Pulse and Pulse X to move right now. You're not going to wake up one morning and ink's going to be up to $10. And then all these farms are going to get turned back on. Basically, that's not what's going to happen. First, it's going to start with a, like a slow, methodical push from Pulse Chain and in Pulse X. And then uh, once this thing starts to overperform and, you know, Pulse X is like pushing up into these levels, then you'd see ink really start to overperform. When this thing's going parabolic is when you'll see ink and Pulse X move. And that's when people will be reattracted to the farms. But first Pulse has to move. Well, just the, the ideal too of, you know, Rich talked about before having the liquidity bonding, having the premier decks and pulse chain doesn't ink need to be valuable in some way to make sure like not just the liquidity bonding for the blue chips. Cause I mean, kind of, I mean, that seems to be doing okay, but just the bonding in general for, for everyone's token to just, um, to secure the rocket ship, I guess for everything to be bonded. I don't know. Where, where does ink fit into that? Like it, it being mediocre versus it being great. Like it was, what's the difference? Um, when I look at this against Pulse, there's nothing about this from a from a, any sort of tokenomic or anything that makes this great. It's going to take some other utility being added onto it to make people to stop nuking it like this. Inverse um, reflation, inflation chart. And who knows? Maybe there's like a protocol add-on that somebody creates that burns ink like crazy. Maybe somebody creates Titan Ink X or something like that. And it's like Titan X with ink. I don't know. Like it just this it's there needs to be something else that in my mind to really because otherwise what you have is you're basically waiting for the second year. So that, you know, on a on a trend line like this, you know, here's year one, here's year two, here's year three, here's year four. This year, the, the, the supply inflates by 100%. This year, by 50% from the total of the previous year. This year, 33%, you know, and so on and so forth. So that, so, you know, you get 100%, and this year you get 150%. Now you have 150 plus, 100, you know, 33%. So there's less and less supply coming off per year. And it what will happen to the price over these longer-term time frames is... The most inflation is at the beginning. So the price did this and then somebody will set a floor and then they'll come in and they'll buy a bunch of it up and then it'll year two, there'll be less of it compared to the total supply. 
and then year three there'd be less of it compared to the total supply to sell and the so the dumping becomes more distributed because along this path the whales keep absorbing the lows and creating price floors but there's also more and more users coming into the system over time as prices rise you get more adoption you get more users you get more distribution of the ink you know more people selling more distribution of supply and there's less of it compared to the total so it's kind of like a longer term play i think um ten dollar ink is probably it for the next two years i would say if we're lucky but uh if like again because of the liquidity bonding you know if pulse goes up like mad maybe it'll pull ink up with it but when pulse went up and did that 80 percent move ink only went up seven, same same percentage so 80 percent in nine days pulse did 91 percent. so ink didn't even cap didn't even catch up to, to pulse during that particular pump but the more bullish that pulse gets the more gains there is to put into the other coins so it's more of like a ink and pulse x are like late cycle bloomers with that kind of thing in mind in terms of just strictly price action um and and any other utility added on to it we can't know it's it's going to come from somebody or somewhere yeah it's, it's one of those things that uh, i'm excited to see it i'm excited to see the uh, like i said earlier that like inverse inflation model like that keeps going down the more inflation it goes up but yeah, maybe when the inflation stops and, uh, again, pulse goes up, a lot of it's paired to it, too. It, it would be weird if it didn't go up. Like, if I, I, I couldn't see if we, you know, see a penny pulse chain and ink is still sitting at, you know, I don't know, even if it's sitting at 5 or $10, I'd be like, shouldn't this thing be 100 bucks or 500 bucks or something at this point with all the liquidity and all the, I mean, assuming at that point the farming's went nuts, you know, and we're all rich. Pulse you got to wonder if... Um if the admins of Pulse Chain won't come in and change the tokenomics of ink at some point, just say, you know, we're going to change it now. It's deflationary now, you know, because is that, is that within their power? I don't know. I think there are some knobs. I'm not sure exactly which knobs for that. I mean, there's, I mean, there's, even if there isn't, you know, who knows if some of the uh, entities in power have been uh, collecting ink from uh, the, the quote fair launch, the fair launch that occurred with it too, uh, with, with all the no OA and all that stuff. So it'll be interesting to see. Uh, another question I want to ask too, well, anything more on, uh, on yield farming or otherwise? Um, I, I'm, it's just not my expertise, but I, I mean, there is opportunity out there to make passive income and earn more units. So I would, you know, I kind of pointed out that this one in particular, um, I mean, it's it's crazy out there. If you go and look into other protocols, there's an infinite number of yield farms out there, and uh, so I just think it's it's just tough to find the right things. I just only looked at this one, but uh, I mean, there's yield farming on PHUX, um, and um, Nine Inch has it, and so there's other places that you can get. If you're if farms are your thing and you want to get more units and you believe in those projects, then th these are the kinds of ways you do it. Well, people talk about single side staking too. And I just, it just occurred to me during the stream, I was like, you know, if you're going to earn third party tokens through single side staking, wouldn't you want to have that during the bull, bull, bull run when people are actually launching tokens that could be incentivized with, you know, launching them on here to distribute supply and stuff like that? Like it wouldn't even adding that feature right now when, you know, crypto's, you know, dead right now as far as like retail and stuff coming in. Um, yeah, it's, we're certainly not in the middle of a bull bull market. Doesn't seem to be right now. Uh, I um, not to not to clash with you too much, but I I I think we've been in a bull market since Bitcoin bottomed back here. Yeah, yeah. But okay, so do you think we're? I guess okay. I'll phrase it like this. I don't think we're in a, a uh, you know euphoria type type atmosphere where oh, if you no, did no. a launch single side staking, it would it would just blow up with all kinds of coins trying to get in. That, I guess it's lost. Yeah, say. there's there, we're waiting like the. the if that's not clear, like guys, the the stuff, the knobs haven't all been turned on full blast yet for a reason. Like we're waiting for something, some form of clarity. So hang in there. Um, you can you can find plenty of uh, RH quotes that goes on and talks about, you know, what is the narrative? Like fifty weeks, or um, you know, whoever's with me in five years, you know, whoever's not on my side in five years is going to have major regrets. Stuff like that. Um, there's so many. I've heard out that there. one. 
that's, that's a good yeah. One. When he was that. on with uh, he was on with Cabana, and they were on with the Wall Street trader yeah. guy, and Richard's yeah. sitting there saying like, you know, you're gonna look really dumb like in five years. I'm paraphrasing like in five years. Everyone that followed me's portfolio will outperform your portfolio of your entire lifetime or something like that. 